In do-it-yourself projects or customized systems based on Raspberry Pi, we often need to interact directly with the operating system or change some configuration, and this can be confusing in many cases. So I'm here to try to help you with this task, which can be commonplace in many cases. But first, let me tell you who the actors in this scene are. So what is RetroPie? It's software that includes emulators, front-end interfaces, and global configuration tools to allow you to get your retro games console up and running without having to do lots of tedious installations and configurations manually. It includes the following important subsystems. RetroArch implements the Libretro API. This API allows developers to create emulators or any 2D video game called cores that are exclusively concerned with running the game code. The RetroArch front-end takes care of everything related to audio, video, and interface for the core. All the core needs to do is execute the content. RetroPie is also installed with Emulation Station, the interface that allows you to run games, as well as configure them per game or per system. However, Emulation Station is more than an interface. Think of it as a virtual assembly line that combines the content of the game you want to run with a configuration file, uses RetroArch to load it into the libretto core, and then launches the whole package for you as a playable game. Whether you've installed RetroPie manually or loaded a pre-built image, you should be booted into Emulation Station and be on the main screen. If you have ROMs loaded, you can launch them from here, but by default the only option is to access RetroPie's configuration menu. This menu exposes some of RetroPie's most important configuration options and also replaces some of Raspbian's configuration features, since you probably won't spend much time on the Raspbian desktop once RetroPie is installed. Many of these options are for advanced users only, and playing around with them can seriously mess up your RetroPie configuration if you start changing configuration files on a whim. I recommend changing as little as possible so that the features you know you want are activated, and many users will be perfectly happy with RetroPie right out of the box without any changes. The first option, Audio, allows you to set the audio output. By default, it should be set to HDMI if the Pi is connected via an HDMI cable. If you prefer to use a 3.5mm cable to connect the Pi to an audio receiver, you can do so here. The Bluetooth menu is used to pair Bluetooth devices such as keyboards or controllers if you have a Raspberry Pi 3, or a Bluetooth dongle on an older Pi model. The first time you run it, you may need to install some Bluetooth prerequisite packages. The Configuration Editor is used to define configuration files for the RetroArch cores as well as to define global Libretro options. In some cases, there are too many options but in many cases it exposes the actual configuration files as if it were a text editor. Be aware that these options are for advanced users only. ES Themes allows you to set different themes for Emulation Station. These themes are only cosmetic. So, have fun. The File Manager allows you to move files around in the Raspberry Pi's file system. It's a bit complicated, and if you need to manage a lot of files, I strongly recommend that you boot into the Raspberry Desktop or use an SFDP utility to move the files, in the same way that you load ROMs. The RasPi Config option just loads the Raspberry Pi configuration utility that comes with Raspbian. It is used to set various global options such as language, localization, and boot options that affect the entire operating system not just RetroPie. The RetroArch option loads the RetroArch interface. There are more details on this in another video, and RetroPie handles many of these options for you. For example, Emulation Station and Run Command load RetroArch with specific settings whenever you start a game, without the need to do this manually in the RetroArch menu. In the RetroArch NetPlay option, you can configure the settings for RetroArch's multiplayer features. Although you can play with your friends on the same sofa, RetroPie also supports multiplayer on networks. You can change these settings here. 
RetroPie setup opens the same dialog tree used to install RetroPie originally. It allows you to update the installation, as well as install modules that may have been overlooked originally. More importantly, it allows you to access configuration options and tools. Some of these options, such as Bluetooth and audio, are duplicated in the main RetroPie configuration screen. But there is one important option you should know about, Samba. Samba is used to create Windows-style network shares on the Raspberry Pi. By choosing this option, you can install the Samba software from the internet and then install the shares once the installation is complete. Using Samba is one of the easiest ways to load ROMs onto your Pi, so this option shouldn't be ignored. In fact, I recommend installing it right now. Once the Samba installation is complete, you'll need to install the RetroPie Samba shares. Just choose the first option. They will be installed automatically. Back to the main RetroPie screen. The Run Command Configuration option changes what is displayed when the games are run. Menu options and box art can be enabled or disabled. And you can change the CPU priority if you're having problems with slowdowns. Take a special look at the Show IP options. There are many useful ways to interact with RetroPie over the network, and for this you'll need to know its IP address. Depending on your personal network configuration, this may be subject to change from time to time, but I recommend that you make a note of it until you have finished configuring RetroPie. Here is my Ethernet IP address. The splash screens option is used to change the image that appears on the screen when emulation station is starting up. RetroPie is supplied with a small selection, but you can use your own if you wish. They need to be copied to the directory shown next to option 2, in my case the splash screens directory and then you can select them from here. The splash screens need to be PNG images with the same resolution as your screen. The last option in RetroPie is the Wi-Fi settings. You can join Wi-Fi networks here if you have a Raspberry Pi 3 or a Wi-Fi dongle connected to an older model. Most of the configuration files that RetroPie runs are located in the configs directory. System-specific settings are located in their appropriate directory and global settings are located in the all directory. RetroPie is a powerful system, and you can make many detailed changes by editing these files. That said, let me tell you a bit about RetroPie. RetroArch is RetroPie's implementation of the Libretro API. The programs that implement Libretro, called cores, are combined with a front end, such as RetroArch, and a game file, called Content, in the Libretro language to create a complete emulated game. The front end provides drivers for audio, video, and input, and the core only needs to provide the code to interpret the game ROM. This allows core developers to concentrate on creating better emulators without having to worry about supporting every variation of hardware it might run on. It also means that any core that correctly implements the Libretto API is instantly compatible with all Libretto frontends. RetroPie uses RetroArch, but there are many Libretto frontends out there, and each correctly designed core works with each frontend. RetroPie comes with many cores available, which means that if you find others independently, you can port them to RetroArch and RetroPie without any problems. For non-developers, RetroArch also implements some useful additional features beyond cross-system compatibility. It allows you to use shaders in real-time during the game. By invoking the RetroArch menu in-game, you can apply a number of different aesthetic looks to your games, such as simulating CRT scan lines or screen curvature. It can also sharpen text and change the color balance. RetroArch also supports virtualization of controls, Games don't have to be configured with specific physical controllers in mind. Instead, RetroArch assigns physical controller buttons to a virtual RetroPad controller, which the cores can read. This means that games will be played in the same way, regardless of whether you're using a keyboard, a USB gamepad, or even arcade sticks and buttons. Perhaps most useful is the fact that RetroPie implements save states. 
Save states allow you to save the game instantly. In fact, they save the entire ROM status, which means that when the save state is loaded, the game continues from exactly where it left off. Please note that not all RetroPie compatible emulators are Libretro cores, and although items such as save states tend to be universal across all emulators, they may be handled differently. In addition, you may need to reconfigure the controls in certain emulators if they don't handle virtual gamepads in the same way. All in all, RetroArch supports a large number of useful features, and if you want to play ROMs on a system for which there are cores available, I strongly recommend using it. So let's move on to the Emulation Station. Emulation Station is the graphical interface that ties the various parts of RetroPie together. It allows you to navigate different systems, launch games, and configure settings. Much of this video involves using Emulation Station in one way or another, but I want to point out a few features that might be easily missed. The home screen of Emulation Station is the system browser. To start with, when no ROMs are loaded, only the RetroPie configuration page is available. For the purposes of this video, I've loaded some ROMs to give Emulation Station a more typical appearance. You can hit the A button, that's whatever you've configured the A button to be, not necessarily the letter A on the keyboard, to enter any of the systems and see the loaded games. While there you can press left and right to cycle between systems. Notice how the ROMs I've loaded are just described by title? It looks kind of boring, doesn't it? Fortunately, Emulation Station can automatically scrape online databases for game information, as long as the titles of your ROMs are accurate. Press the Start button and choose Scraper. Go down to Scrape Now and Start. This requires an active internet connection and can sometimes take a while. For each ROM in the ROMs folder, it should find one or more titles for you to select and then automatically download images and descriptions based on those titles. If it finds nothing, it's possibly a very obscure game, or the file name doesn't match what the game database is looking for. Emulation Station searches the game's DB and DebBet for game info. You can always search there manually to make sure your game is listed. Now that the games are scraped, you can see that there's cover art and a brief description for each game. If you have a large number of games, there's an automated scraper available under the RetroPie setup menu. Go into Configuration Tools and you can see it down here, option 823. It's much faster, but it doesn't give you the chance to correct any misidentified game. When you first launch Emulation Station, you're prompted to configure some sort of controller, whether a keyboard, a USB controller, or arcade controls. You can access that configuration screen again by pressing Start from within Emulation Station, then choosing Configure Input, and just choose Yes. And then any detected controller can be configured from here. Just press and hold down a button to start configuring. As before, you can press a key to assign it to the currently highlighted option, or press and hold any key to skip to the next option. You can also use a different controller to scroll down and select OK when you're finished. By default, Emulation Station starts with a lightweight visual theme, suitable for any model of Raspberry Pi. However, you can change the theme if you want, and RetroPie includes a great many to choose from. To change the theme, enter the RetroPie configuration menu, then choose ES Themes. Read the warning about having ROMs for 10 plus systems that pops up. Pi 2 segment hashtag thumbs hashtag prime. This is especially important for people using older Raspberry Pi models. If you are using an older Pi and have that many systems in use, consider limiting which themes you choose. From the themes menu, I recommend downloading the themes gallery, the first option. When it's done downloading, Choose the first option again to view the theme gallery and hit enter a second time to view. The theme is downloaded from the internet, which might take a minute. Once it's downloaded, you can back out to the Emulation Station home screen. To apply the theme, press Start to access the menu. Then choose UI Settings and scroll all the way down to the bottom. Select Theme Set 
and scroll left or right to choose the theme you want, and then hit back to apply it. It might take a moment to be applied. When it's done installing, there's an occasional bug, where the screen would turn totally white, or certain screen elements won't display. Not to worry. Just hit Start to open the menu, then choose Quit and Restart Emulation Station. When Emulation Station comes back up, your new theme will be ready to use. So that's it, folks. Thanks for watching, whoever made it this far. Consider subscribing, and see you in the next video.